Thank you so much. Please be seated. Well, this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Jesus all the day long. Amen? 45 years have passed by. I started off when I was 21 years old. Walked out of my home with a shoulder bag with tracts and my Bible. Never knew what I was supposed to do. Never had a clue what I could do. I wondered why God called me. I wondered why did he mess up my life. You know, I had a decent job. I had a nice future. He messed it all up, threw me out of my house, out of the streets. <laughs> Amen. And uh, literally I lived on the streets. I slept in front of shops in the night. Didn't have a place to go. I used to walk about 15, 20 miles every day. Not that I liked walking. I didn't have the few pennies to pay for my bus fare. And I used to go without food for four or five days. My greatest miracle in those days was, was something to eat. And uh, so I just wondered, why did he call me? I could have been better off if I had the job that I could have had some money and he could have had some money. It seemed like we both were broke. <laughs> so here we are. And uh, God kept on telling me, I called you to evangelize the nation of India. It's just nagging me. And I said, okay, stop, stop, I heard you. You know, I thought it's not a big deal, but I found out it was a big deal. I started to do some research and then I found out that I live in a country of complex nature. It was a nation of nations. You know, in 1976, we had only uh, 620 million people. Today, we've got 1.25 billion people. We speak 22 major languages. It is not a dialect because we've got over 1,000 dialects. You know, you cross, we've got 29 states, you cross the border, you're almost like another country. You know, you, you don't want to go there because you can't speak their language, you don't like their food, and you don't like their culture, you hate them. <laughs> so what do you do? And this was a country, and God was telling me, go and evangelize the nation of India. And I had nothing, no money, and what do you do? But he was nagging so much, let me do something. So I decided to have a street meeting. I went and put up four poles and a, a tarp on the top to make it look like a platform and a couple of gas lanterns. You have to my age to understand that. The young people don't know. You pump the gas and a mantle glows. Yeah, it's a pretty decent and cheap deal. So that was my crusade. And the good thing about India is no matter what you do, about two, three hundred people will come around wanting to see what you're doing. <laughs> so you don't have a problem to get people. You don't need to stand on your head to do that. So they all came and I didn't know much to say from the Bible, so I kept on telling them Jesus loves you and told them that Jesus is a healer and Jesus will heal you and Jesus will set you free. So I'll call out to the people to come for prayer. That's the only thing that I knew. So people came, I was telling in the other service, you know, I say to the people that Jesus wants to heal you because this is not a, an advertised crowd. So we did not tell the people to come for healing, for prayer and all that. So this is an instant crowd right around me at the street. So you don't expect many hard, sick people, okay? So you are thinking if there is any kind of sickness, it could be just a headache or, or a toothache, maybe a pimple on their face, you know, something like that. So that's what you expect. And, and as I was waiting for some to come, and suddenly a guy was bringing another guy, holding his hands, walking towards me, and I'm thinking, why is he holding his hands? Why he can't he walk on his own? And as he got closer, I realized he was a blind man. 
And I said to God, no, this is not on. No, this is not the deal. What I'm asking for prayer, this has to be just something easy. You know, you don't do that to a guy who has never prayed for any sick person before, and you don't bring a blind man to start with. <laughs> but he's standing in front of me, and he said, you call me for prayer. I said, okay, I did, but not you really, you know. <laughs> So, what do you do? So, all right, let just me do anything. So, I laid hands on his both eyes, squeezed his as hard as I can, you know. <laughs> and I prayed. I said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I command his eyes to be opened. And I took my hands off and he said, I can see, I can see. I said, you can't see. You shouldn't see. But he can see. Well, I said, it worked. <laughs> you just opened the eyes of this guy. God set him free. And I've never looked back. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Next day, I'm having the same meeting, right? <laughs> and uh, as I was praying, and I'm preaching, and a lady got up from the back and she started running like a hundred meters race. You know, she's running. And I'm thinking to myself, I did not say anything bad about their gods. I did not offend them. Why is she running so close to me? And what does she want to do? She's screaming and running. And the, as she came closer, she just crashed on the floor like a crash landing of a plane. And... Uh, and she's screaming, and she said something like this, Jesus, leave me alone. And I'm thinking, I'm not Jesus. So what is she calling out to? Then I remembered in the Bible, I have read that the people who are demon possessed are calling out to Jesus like this. So then I thought, maybe she is demon possessed. So I should try. I should ask the demon to come out. <coughs> so I laid hands on her and I said, shut up, don't scream. I command you to come out of this woman. And sure enough, to my great surprise, the demon came out. Amen? So I became a healer and a deliverer of all the demons and everything in two days with no expenses. <laughs> Just all free. And that ministry is what you heard has grown from zero to 4,500 churches today. Amen? <laughs> and so many other things. I take care of 17 orphanages, hundreds of children. We take care of orphan children. And uh, we got uh, sewing schools for destitute women more than 70 sewing schools. So at any given day, more than 1,000 women are taught to sew in all through our sewing schools. And you saw the schools, and the latest one was, of course, the, the school that was built. You saw the building, and uh, just finished. And we have got about four or 50 children ready to go to school in the Radiant School in India, and they will start their school next month in July. Amen? So there we go. God has been so good. And uh, I was sitting with uh, Pastor Lee a few months ago, and we, I talked about the school, the building coming up and all that. And I said to him in between all that, I said, you know, I think that you should build another school. And she looked at me. He didn't say no. That's a good sign. <laughs> and uh, so he nodded his head. And he said, where do you want to build it? Well, I've got plenty of places to do that. So I said, well, you should think about it, and we are praying. So I have put a word to him. So please remind him that we need to build a school in India. Would you do that for me? <laughs> eh? That will be a great thing. Hallelujah. And I want you to know Radiant Church has built three orphanage buildings and two school buildings. Apart from buying bicycles, apart from buying sewing machines and all that that you have done, 
just like Pastor John was saying, you know. Uh, this is the only place in this country I read it was written the village. I've never read that in any other place. You know, Richland is a village? I thought it was a city, you know. So anyway, so but you have done such an amazing work for us in India. The only thing is we are not finished yet, so you are not done yet. <laughs> Amen. Continue to pray and believe God with us and let us do some great work for the work in India. Well, I've been asking people to pray for a change of government, if you recall, because the, the prime minister was a very anti-Christian man and after he came to power five years ago, we have had so many uh, persecutions and uh, pastors being killed and uh, so we wanted him to go. So we all were praying. We have prayed like never before in a thousands, tens of thousands of Christians. And we all prayed, and guess what? He won with a bigger majority this time. And he came to power two weeks ago. And we are thinking maybe we should never pray again. You know? This is not a good deal. And we thought he would be gone, but he's there for another five years. So we don't know why he wants to change the Constitution. He wanted to make... Christianity illegal, he would like to do all those things, but he can't do anything without our Jesus, can he? Amen? I was walking through this small, a little church, you know, you see sometimes in front of the church something is written, you know, they write some nice things on that, and I looked up, and I saw this is what was written on a board in front of the church, and it said something like this, no matter who your prime minister is, Jesus is always the king. You like that? I said, well, here we go. Amen. We don't care who the prime minister is. But Jesus is still always the king. Amen. And he can take care of us and he can lead us. And we believe that with all our hearts. And God will lead us and guide us. Amen. We got one of our pastors killed. He became a martyr for Jesus Christ. Leaving his wife and three children behind. They shot him dead. And I rushed to the place. I met with his wife and the three little kids. And I said to them, you know, let me take you away from here to some far place where you can start your life again. And she looked at me and she said, no, Pastor, I don't want to go. I wanted to stay back here and continue the work that God has given to my husband and myself. He has gone to be with the Lord, but I want to continue the work. So please allow me to stay here. So there she is with her children, continuing the ministry, the same place where her husband became a martyr. Well, I, of course, I support them and I take care of them and I want the people to protect their family. And there they are, working for the Lord. Amen? So that is on one side, on the eastern side of India. Somebody died for Jesus Christ. And on the western side of India, in one of the churches that I have, a man got ill and is very sick and to death, and they took him to the hospital, and there he died in the hospital. So the doctor pronounced him dead, and they normally put a cloth over the face of the dead body. And the wife said, said no, 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 don't, don't cover his face. Just leave him alone, because he's coming back. So the Lord, doctor looked at her, thinking, well, it's a little crazy. It's okay, she's sad. So he left her and walked away. And she sent word to my pastor, saying, come quickly, I need you. The pastor rushed to the place. After two hours, he got to the hospital. He was thinking that he was supposed to pray for the man. Maybe, uh, you know, he's having some suffering. But by the time he got here, the wife looked at him and smiled, and she said, I was waiting for you. I said, great, what? Well, my husband died about three hours ago, so I was waiting for you to come and raise him up. So the, my pastor told me, later, you know, later, he said, I'm standing there and thinking, what's wrong with this woman? When somebody dies, we bury the person. And he's asking her as if that you know, somebody just sleeping. He says, raise him up. So I didn't want to offend her. So I said, I was going to pray a small prayer so that, you know, she'll be happy. And nothing is going to happen. Then we'll take the dead body and bury him. So as I started to pray this lousy prayer, and in the middle of that, I felt this woman has got the faith to see her husband come back to life. And here is a pastor 
And what am I doing? So I, I said, I put my hands heavy on the, on the dead body and I started praying with all the faith that I can say, so, Lord, here is a wife and me. We are agreeing together. And I pray in the name of Jesus, this man should come back to life. And I command you to rise up. And the next thing, the dead body rose up and sat on the, on the bed. Amen? So they packed up their bags and went home. Amen? On one side, somebody became a martyr. On the other side, there. Jesus raises somebody once from the dead. Amen? It's all Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen? Hallelujah. You know, I was in, the, in, the, in your Grand Rapids airport about, about four, four months ago. And whenever I'm at the airport, you know, people look at me strange. Maybe I look strange, you know, an Indian guy. So I'm used to that. So this uh, gentleman was looking at me, and I was looking at him. I thought maybe one of those people. And then I went to the restroom. And I came out, and this time he was standing just outside the restroom. And he was looking at me, and he said, excuse me. I said, yes. He said, have you ever been to the Radiant Church in, in Richland? I said, yes, I have, a few times. And he said, I go to that church. I said, wonderful. And he said, you happen to be the missionary from India? I said, that's what I am, sir. So we started talking to each other. We talked about the work and all that. And then he said, you, you always ask about the bikes. You want to have bikes for the, for the pastors. I said, of course, we, we need more than 300 bikes. And he smiled, and in between, he put his hand in his pocket, and he pulled out a bunch of money, and he gave me $1,000 in cash. And he gave it to me, and he said to me, you know, I want you to go and buy some bicycles. I said, thank you so much. And I'm thinking, well, he, God raised him up and brought him to the, to the airport to give me some money to buy the bicycle. So what is the moral of the story for every one of you? If you ever see me at the airport, don't even look at me. <laughs> Pretend that as you don't know me and walk away from me. Because if you happen to come and say hi, well, it's going to cost all your money. <laughs> and we are going to turn that into bicycles. So there you go. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. God is a good God. Continue to pray for us and do whatever you can so we can reach the nation of Jesus Christ for the Lord Jesus Christ, the India. Amen? Got a little bit of thing to preach. Is that okay with you? Yes. Huh? Or are you already tired of me? <laughs> well, if you are, well, too bad. <laughs> I'm going to say it anyway because this is the last service, so nobody is going to show me signs. You know, to quit. And then it will become like the signs and wonders ministry. The pastor sits there and makes all the signs. And I'll stand here and start wondering what's going on. Okay? So here we go. I want to share with you a message that I believe is a message for every one of us today. Is what I will call to be able to hear a new sound. A new sound is coming. And we should have the ears to hear the sound the Lord wants to bring it to our lives. Amen? 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 41. We read like this. And then Elijah said to Ahab, Go up and eat and drink, for there is the sound of an abundance of rain. So that's my message for you, friends. I believe the Lord is wanting to bring an abundance of rain into the life of every one of us here today. Amen? When the story begins here, this was a time there was no rain for three and a half years. Famine, dryness, is all because of a wicked king by name Ahab. He and his wife Jezebel have messed up the whole country of Israel. And because of that, when you read in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, it talks about the blessings of people when we follow the Lord and obey his commandments, about from verse 1 to 15. And then when you go further, it talks about the curse that comes upon people 
who will commit sin and turn their back on God. And as you read that in verse 23 and 24, it says, because you have sinned against me, God says, that I have shut the heavens with bronze and your earth will become like iron. So that's what happens. So God shut the heavens. It became a brace in heaven. And the earth has become iron. You can, cannot do anything. Nothing it will bring out to us. And that's because of the sin of man. It's the sin of Ahab and Jezebel. And the Bible says that Jezebel killed about so many prophets of God. And she has got all these ball, the prophets of Baal in, in, her, in her palace. Things are going so bad in three and a half years that God has punished the nation without any rain. And God relented and again, God calls upon uh, 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 on Elijah. And God tells Elijah, I'm going to bring rain to the land. Amen? And that's a good news I want to share with you today. God is going to bring rain into our lives. Amen? A land of darkness. Friends, we are living in a world that is full of darkness today. What is going on in this place? What is going on? among the people, the laws of the country, the governments. What is happening? We are living in the most perverse nations, perverse world that we have ever known. Nothing has gone wrong this way ever before. And this is what we are seeing. Dryness, spiritual famine, even physical famine, darkness everywhere. There's no rain. It's dry all over the place. And I believe that when we are going through these situations like this, on and off, in between, God will raise a hero. God will raise heroes to come up and speak his word and bring rain into the place that is so much of in need. Amen? And I believe with all my heart today that we have been raised as the heroes in this darkest time of this universe. I believe that the church is the only hope for this world. How many of you believe that? Do you know that you are the only hope for this world? What will happen to this world if we are not here? If there is no church in this world today, what will be the condition of this world? It will be absolutely messed up. It's already messed up. It will be destroyed. But God is having mercy upon this world because of a group of men and women crying before God, wanting to live, live a godly life, wanting to walk in his ways. That is why we are the heroes that God is looking and God is saying, I'm going to use you to bring the rain into this world. Amen? Are you happy with that? You look so serious. You know, I'm thinking, what am I saying? Am I saying some bad things here? You know, well, if you feel like that, I'm going to say it anyway. Amen? God has called you and me to be the hero to bring change into this world. If any change is going to happen, it's going to be because of you. It's going to be because of me. Amen? So he called all the people and he said to them, we are going to put to test today who is the living God. And the plan was about 450, um, you know, the prophets of Baal and Elijah all alone on the other side. The plan is they should build the altar and put the sacrifice of the bull, cut it into pieces, and call out to God to bring the fire to consume the sacrifice. That was the plan. So he said, because you guys are too many, why don't you do it first, and then I'll do it later. So here 450 uh, prophets crying and praying and cutting their body, then bleeding all over, calling out to their gods, and Elijah standing there and mocking at them, and nothing happened till the evening. And this is the time for Elijah. And the Bible says Elijah built the altar that was broken. You know, that's the beginning of bringing God's power and God's glory. You build the altar, you repair the altar that needs to be built again. And I believe that we need to do in our lives because some of our altars are broken. In, all along the way of a walk with the Lord. And we have to ask ourselves today, what are the, the altars that I need to build in my life? 
You have to ask yourself, what about my altar of my prayer life? What about the altar of my spending time with God? What is the altar of me meditating God's word? What is the altar of me, my, my giving to God? Uh, so many altars, what are they? If that is broken, it's time for us to rebuild it because God is getting ready to bring the fire down and consume the sacrifice that we put before him today. Amen? He put the sacrifice and the fire came and it just consumed, the, burned the sacrifice, just took everything out. And Elijah killed all those prophets of Baal. And now he comes to the king and he says, hey, I hear a sound. Amen? I wonder whether you hear the sound today. It is not an ordinary sound. It is a sound of an abundant rain. Amen? A sound that is going to make all the difference for you and me. A sound that is going to bring rain into the dryness the sound that brings the rain into your life, bringing abundance of blessing upon your life, bringing healing to your sick body, bringing deliverance into the situations of your life, into the situation of your financial situation, your family, your children. The Lord is saying it's time that I'm about to bring an abundant rain upon your life. Amen? Do you want an abundant rain? Or would you like to live in the dryness for the next three and a half years? What would you like? Would you like the abundant rain? Because I want you to hear the sound. The sound is coming. I can hear that. My spiritual ears is hearing there's something happening in the heavenlies. Something is happening. The brace and door is opening. Something is happening because the Lord is about to pour the rain upon every one of your life. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. He sent the king and he went to Mount Carmel and he's just starting to pray, put his head between his legs and pray. And in the prayer, he said to his disciple, I wanted to go towards the sea and see if there is anything happening on the sky. Do you see any clouds? He goes there once, twice, three, five times, nothing is happening. He said, no, nothing, Master. He said, go again. On the seventh time, seven speaks about perfection. Seven speaks about God's timing. And you keep on doing it until God is about to move. Don't stop on the fifth time. Don't stop even at the sixth time. Go on the seventh time because things are going to change. Amen? And on the seventh time, he saw right on the horizon, he saw a little cloud the size of the, the fist of a hand of a man. He said, that's all I can see. If that's okay with you, I saw that. And Elijah said, that's what I want because I can see the abundant rain that is stuck in that small cloud and it is going to come down so heavy, even Ahab is going to be boggled in his chariot. Amen? God's abundant rain is about to come through the little things that we see. Through the thing that is so insignificant for you and me. But I want you to know that God has got his miracle that was all packed up in that, in that small cloud and that is about to become a torrential rain that you and I are looking for in our life. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. God is going to bring a rain into your life. That's my message for you all the way from India. God is going to take the dryness of your life. God is going to take away the problems in your life. The God is about to pour his rain upon your life. Amen? Yes. Hallelujah. That's what God wants to do. Isaiah says here in his book, in the book of Isaiah chapter 60, there he says, Arise and shine, for the light has come. Amen? Darkness is going to go. Light is going to come. And, God, and Isaiah says, time for you to rise up and shine because the glory of the Lord will be revealed in this world. Amen? The glory of the Lord is going to be revealed in your life, in my life. And that's what he's going to do. I believe with all my heart the Lord is going to send an amazing revival 
in this land, in this world, in these last days. Amen? I have an anti-Christian government. I got an anti-Christian prime minister. They wanted to shut us down, but I believe you might try to do anything, but I see a revival. I see the people of God moving in the miraculous in the land of India. We are going to bring millions and millions of people into the kingdom of God because I hear the rain coming. I hear the rain for the revival is coming. I hear the rain coming into the land of America. I believe the Lord is going to do whatever you have seen. It is nothing compared to what God is going to do for you in the coming days. Amen. Get ready. Get ready for the mighty revival. Get ready for the abundant rain. Amen. And let me read verse 5. You will like that. It is in chapter 60, Isaiah. Verse 5 says, Then you shall see and become radiant. I thought you would like that. <laughs> right? You will become radiant and your heart shall swell with joy. Amen? Hallelujah. What happened in the beginning of the church of Jesus Christ? What happened in the day of Pentecost? What happened when they were waiting in one accord, waiting for the promise of the Father to come? What happened in chapter 2 of the book of Acts? We read in verse 2 like this. As they were waiting, there was a sound from heaven. Amen? And not only just the sound, it was turned into a mighty wind. And the wind blew into that upper room where they were all waiting. And then they started seeing. They heard the sound first. And then they saw, saw this amazing cloven tanks of fire, and they came and sat upon every one of them. Amen? And they started to speak in tongues that they have never spoken before. And something happened to the church that day. Something happened through that sound from heaven. Something happened through the cloven tongues of fire. What happened was their lives were transformed. That that Peter was never the same again. John was never the same again. Even the doubting Thomas was not suffered, never the same again. He got to that little tiny sailboat. He traveled all the way, came to the land called India, and he walked in there with the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm standing before you 2,000 years later because a man came, because the fire came from heaven, and the, the power of God came upon them. That changed the world. And here we are, about to change the world one more time. You ready for that? Stand with me. Let's pray together. Stand with me, my dear friends. Do you hear the sound? In which area of your life you need a rain? Today's your day. Today's your day, friends. In every area, any area of your life, God is about to pour his rain. He's going to take away the dryness. He's going to take away the sickness. He's going to take away the poverty. He's going to take away the struggle on your financial situation. He's going to take away the problems and he's going to pour his rain upon the dryness and he's going to bring changes into your life today. You're ready for that? You want the rain to come? You want the rain to flow upon your life? You want to walk out from here not dry anymore, but drenched in this rain. Ready for that? Lift up your hands towards heaven. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for my brothers and sisters today, Lord. Thank you for your rain. We are sick and tired of being in dryness. We are tired of being in the famine, Lord. We are tired of being sick. Lord, we pray let the rain come upon us, Lord. Let the rain of healing, let the rain of abundance, let the rain of deliverance, let the rain of prosperity that will come upon every one of the people we are today, Lord. And I pray your blessing will come upon them and that you will touch everyone, Lord. And your mighty hand of power will be manifested in every one of their lives, Lord. I command people to be healed from their sickness, Lord. I see today the Lord is touching about three people. The Lord is healing your back. You've been struggling with the back problem for the last several months and the Lord is touching and healing you today. I see the Lord touching someone who has been struggling with a liver problem. I see the Lord touching and healing you today. I see the rain. I see the rain coming and flowing into the life of people. In Jesus' name, I bless everyone, Lord. 
Bless the church, Lord. Bless my dear friend, Pastor Lee and his team. Bless Jane, Lord. Let the anointing will be upon her body and upon her life, Father. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. You're such a great God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.